Dr. Janina Fisher is a PhD licensed clinical psychologist and instructor at the Trauma Center, which is an outpatient clinic and research center founded by Bessel van der Kolk. I've heard him speak, he's pretty phenomenal. Known for her expertise as an author, speaker, and consultant, she's also an assistant educational director of the Sensor Motor Psychotherapy Institute, director of psychological services, Chiron Clinics UK, an EMDR International Association continuing education provider, and a former instructor at the Harvard Medical School. She's co-author with Pat Ogden of Sensor Motor Psychotherapy and author of Healing the Fragmented Cells of Trauma Survivors. Also overcoming internal self-alienation and transforming the living legacy of trauma a workbook for survivors and therapists. We are really, really thrilled to have you, Dr. Fisher. Thank you so, so much. And I will give you the floor. Okay, thank you. And as my first, uh, my, my first act is to make sure you have your CME sign-in information. So I'm gonna give you all a moment to take down your code and the number to which you have to text it. So let me, I'll just give you a moment to do that. So many important things to do. Okay, so hopefully everybody's got that. So let us talk about having a trauma lens, but having a modern trauma lens. It's so interesting. You know, the trauma field is a very young field. I came to it in 1990 when it was still literally in diapers. Uh, we were just at the very beginning of beginning to understand what trauma was, how endemic it was. Of course, now we've had a year, a very traumatic year, where we have seen almost everything in this picture um, other than 9-11. We have COVID, we have a, a war, uh, a medical war, a health war. We have internal unrest and civil strife. And of course, what I'll call plain old uh, family violence. Now, we're going to talk about trauma in a particular way today. Um, as Karen Sackvitney writes, Psychological trauma can be a unique individual experience of a single event. It can be the unique individual experience of a series of events, or it can be the unique individual experience of a set of enduring conditions. Most of our patients have suffered a set of enduring conditions. Child abuse is an enduring condition. There may be events along the way, but child abuse is, is a threat every single day, even on the days that nothing happens. The same is true of domestic violence. The same is true of war. Uh, we're going to see what happens to the effects of the enduring conditions of COVID. We're beginning to understand that racial trauma is a set of enduring conditions, not just unique events. And this set of enduring conditions or series of events must overwhelm the individual's capacity to tolerate, understand, comprehend, and cope. And or it must convey a sense of threat to life, sanity, or bodily integrity. So, for example, being beaten 
or raped as a child may not be literally, objectively, a life threat. The child is likely to experience it as a life threat. And that's all that's required under this definition. Um, in this world of ours, we're talking a lot about and somehow we've forgotten that trauma still means experiences that are beyond the capacity to tolerate and are subjectively experienced as a threat to life. Having a critical, dismissive, rejecting parent is extremely distressing. It's not traumatic. But many things are traumatic for children that are not traumatic for adults. For example, we have 30, 40 years of attachment research that shows that parents who are frightening or appear frightened have a traumatic effect on their children. Again, probably because children can't evaluate, is this frightening behavior going to kill me or is it just going to scare me? Neglect. Bruce Perry has studied extensively the effects of neglect in the developing brain. The effects look very, very similar to trauma. Again, we're talking not about emotional neglect, but severe neglect. Exposure to violence. We have research that shows that if you're a witness to violence, even if you're not the victim, it has a traumatic impact. We know from Rachel Yehuda that secondary, that there is intergenerational trauma. She has shown in a beautiful study of Holocaust survivor parents and their adult children that if the parent has PTSD, the adult child is statistically likely to have PTSD. Also, whether or not that child was traumatized by some other experience. Um, we forget that medical trauma in childhood leaves a traumatic effect. Um, or accidents, surgeries, medical procedures, and the death of a parent or parent figure for children is traumatic. It's not just a loss, it is frightening. Mary Harvey, who co-founded the Victims of Violence program, one of the first trauma clinics in the U.S., used to tell us, her postdocs, remember, don't worry whether the the client can remember what happened, trauma survivors have symptoms instead of memories. I call it a living legacy. The issue is not the traumatic event. The issue is that the traumatic events leave behind a legacy of symptoms. All the symptoms of major depression, all symptoms we normally associate with PTSD, all the symptoms we associate with the whole range of anxiety disorders, uh, chronic pain and somatization disorders, substance abuse, eating disorders, suicidality, and borderline personality disorder. This field keeps forgetting that we have a very, very extensive literature on the correlation between borderline personality and a history of trauma. Um, why do we keep treating it as a personality disorder when it is very clearly a trauma disorder? And this is the diagram that I show to new clients it is, it's in my new book, Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma. It's in my psychoeducational flip chart. 
And I show it to clients and I ask them, do any of these symptoms look familiar to you? And they laugh and they say, oh, let me just tell you the ones I don't have. And then I ask them a very important question. How did the depression help you to survive? And they never hesitate. I, they immediately say, oh, it was like a blanket that covered me. It was like a cave I could hide in. How did the irritability help you survive? And they say, oh, that's easy. Irritability helps me to push people away. How about loss of interest? How did that help you to survive? And they say, well, then they could take everything away from me, and it didn't matter, right? Because I didn't care about it anymore. If they knew that I cared about something, they would destroy it. So if I didn't care, they couldn't hurt me. And that's enough usually to make my point that all these symptoms represent adaptations to the abnormal environment. Now, we have, have had a problem in our field. As part of our heritage from Freud, the field, again, remember the trauma field began in the late 80s. No one had ever thought about trauma. We thought about veterans having trauma and post-traumatic stress. We thought about rape victims having post-traumatic stress. But the whole idea that the trauma happened to a very large percent of the population and it had effects different from the effects of very highly distressing non-traumatic events. The assumption was, we didn't know anything else, was that Freud's talking cure would work. Just talk about what happened. Have an emotional catharsis. And all will resolve. But that didn't happen. What the field very quickly saw was that clients talked about the traumatic events and all of these symptoms got worse. And, or they didn't remember the traumatic event, so they couldn't talk about it. Right? I probably don't have to tell you that there's a high correlation between trauma and all of our most common diagnoses, including schizophrenia. Ironically, the only diagnosis that does not correlate highly with trauma is bipolar disorder, and, which is very strange because so many trauma patients are being diagnosed bipolar. Uh, now, what we found, as Bessel van der Kolk in particular took advantage of the brain scan technology developed in the early 90s to actually study what happened in the brains of traumatized individuals when they remembered trauma. And what he discovered was that what happened was different than what happened when people remembered non-traumatic events. As he writes, under conditions of extreme stress, there is a failure of memory processing, leaving the sensory elements of the experience unintegrated and unattached. These sensory elements are then prone to return when activated by current reminders. And I can, I can just hear my clients saying, when activated by current reminders, are you kidding? Activated every day by everything. That's what they would say. So what's sensory elements without words? 
there's actually a term in the memory literature. It's implicit memory. We think of memory as explicit. Let me tell you what my life has been like uh, in the past year. That's explicit memory. But as we talk about explicit experiences, often we begin to feel some of the things that went with those experiences. My favorite example is spending time with my family, especially my grandchildren. So if I start to imagine all of them gathered around our our outdoor dining table, uh, where we've socialized through the pandemic, uh, I can look around the table and see their beautiful faces and I feel warm inside, I feel a smile, um, and that's implicit memory. I see the picture, I feel the warmth, and I feel the smile. I don't remember what night it was, where we ate. That's all explicit memory. Um, what I remember is that picture of them and the feelings that it elicits. Now, generally, implicit memories, as Dan Siegel says, don't carry with them the internal sensation that something is being recalled. Right? I can attach my implicit memory to an event because there's a picture, a picture of all of them around the table. But if there were no picture and I just had that warm feeling and the smile, I wouldn't know. Maybe I'm just having a nice day. Um, maybe I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Implicit memories, fear, shame, anger, do not carry with them the internal sensation that something is being recalled. As Bruce Ecker writes, Emotional memory converts the past into an expectation of the future and makes the worst experiences in our past persist as felt realities. So, so our patients still feel betrayed, still feel alone still feel on the outside looking in, still feel the piercing shame. The implicit memories are persisting as felt realities. So let's talk a little bit about the brain. Uh, that's really one of the things that has changed the field so much is to understand trauma not as an event, but to understand trauma as an experience that includes the body and the brain. So here's our brain, and here is a threat. Let's say it's, it's a father with a red face and a clenched fist. That threat cue is... is relayed to a little structure called the amygdala. Many of you probably have heard of it. It is our smoke detector and fire alarm, and also a storage center for emotional memory, a teeny structure. It's actually gigantic here compared to its true size, but it has many jobs. And when the amygdala perceives danger, it sets in motion a set of, of neurochemical events that result in an emergency stress response, and then the prefrontal cortex shuts down. We lose the ability for speech. We lose the ability for good judgment, for problem solving, uh, cause and effect perception, um, everything we 
said we would never do again is not available to you. And uh, the reptilian brain, the brainstem and cerebellum, which control, control our instinctive responses, when stimulated by the emergency stress response, result in impulsive action. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the impulsive actions of trauma survivors. Now, what's very, very important in this diagram is this piece here. The inhibition of the prefrontal cortex interferes with encoding a memory, with witnessing experience, with being able to even describe what happened. Um, and so individuals are left with implicit memories. I often call them feeling flashbacks because client, as soon as I say, oh, that, that desperation, that sense of on the brink, maybe that's a feeling flashback. And they say, yes. And as they begin to understand the attacks of rage are feeling flashbacks, the utter hopelessness and helplessness is feeling flashback. The dread they wake up to every morning is a feeling flashback. Um, there are many symptoms of trauma that represent what I call the chronic expectation of danger. Those two can be implicit memories. The hypervigilance and mistrust that we experience, we, we are often the ones who are mistrusted. Think of that as a memory. It was a memory that helped to keep the client safe from the future betrayal. Usually it didn't prevent it. But, of course, that's what hypervigilance tries to help it. Um, all the array of anxiety, fear, and terror symptoms and post-traumatic paranoia often misdiagnosed as psychosis because when someone says, I'm being stopped, and they have a history of being stopped, or someone's out to get me, and they have a history of someone in the family being out to get them, that's not paranoia, that's memory. Um, all kinds of body memory, um, tightness in the chest or in the jaw can be memory, nausea can be memory, dizziness, numbing, all can be memory. Um, restlessness, difficulty sitting still, difficulty sitting at all, uh, or conversely, being frozen, walking very, very stiffly, or collapse can be a memory. The, it's as if the, the body and the spine remember it was safest to keep your head down and not look up. Um, think of all the clients who, when triggered, hide in the closet, hide under the bed. That's memory. Okay? We don't make a conscious decision. Oh, I think I'll hide in the closet from my children. <laughs> right? It's an impulse, but it comes from implicit memory. And a whole host of the symptoms from all of the diagnoses we commonly work with, all can be implicit memory. The problem is that when you remember implicitly, and you don't know that you're remembering because there are no words or pictures or narrative, as Dan Siegel says, 
When the images and sensations of experience remain in implicit only form, they remain in unassembled neural disarray, not tagged as representations derived from the past. Such implicit only memories continue to shape the subjective feeling we have of our here and now realities, the sense of who we are moment to moment. I'm thinking right now of a client of mine, his subjective feeling of, of who he ha- is and what his present reality is like. He would say, um, I'm a miserable bastard. I'm either angry or depressed or both. I, I don't even know how my wife puts up with me. Um, he has no, no sense of having survived, having created a life that is happy unless he's triggered. When he's triggered and these implicit memories are activated, he, he is angry and depressed. The phenomenon of triggering is actually a brain and body phenomenon. It, it's not psychological. And, and that's partly why our kind of one-to-one correspondence of when we are, think about triggers, for example, women with sexual abuse history will be triggered by men. That's, that's a kind of one correspondence. What happens after trauma is that the brain and, and perceptual system get sensitized to cues that are related even in a very distant and almost perceptible way to the experience of danger. So when it isn't clear, when there's no clear one-to-one uh, correspondence between trigger and, and, and reaction, be curious. Maybe it's the time of day. Maybe it's the season of the year, um, the particular day of the week. Look for those patterns. Um, look for weather conditions. I've had clients who were triggered by the weather conditions, particularly cold, cloudy, snowy, or rainy weather. And when I asked them, what did cold, cloudy, rainy, snowy weather mean to you as a child? They say, oh, I was stuck in the house with my parents, and that wasn't safe. So the other thing to remember about triggering is that when stimuli or cues connected in any way to past danger evoke the the whole emergency stress response, right? The amygdala fires, the prefrontal cortex goes offline, and the emergency stress response system goes into action. Uh, here's a list of triggers compiled by patients in an addiction treatment center. Uh, they were asked, We it was a group, I broke them down into pairs, and I asked each pair to come up with a list of all the things they could think of that triggered them. So many are paradoxical. Being alone or in a group. Change, good or bad. Um, Being ignored or being the center of attention. Um, Being disappointed, disappointing people. Being happy or unhappy. Very, very, very important. And I don't know if it's up here, but another one that was on the original list, which was much longer, um, was um, people failing to follow through. And 
Again, being in a treatment center, much as being in a hospital. There are often times, as you know, when staff can't follow through. That's a huge trigger. In the hospital where I trained, patients who had very strong reactions to being told no were later were labeled, they were pathologized as entitled. Looking back on it, I can see they were triggered. The word no is a huge, huge trigger. When your life experience is that it's always no, and no is always violent. So triggering supports an ongoing chronic sense of threat. And again, we're talking about subtleties, the sound of a door opening, the sound of footsteps, the sound of a car parking or the door opening or a car starting up. And what happens over time is that the trigger becomes the threatening stimulus. Uh, I talk with clients sometimes about demonizing the trigger because once triggered by something, let's say, let's say the business suit becomes a trigger and all men in business suits, suits are now a threat. We've just demonized, we've just turned the business suit into Godzilla. Not intentionally, consciously, or because the patient wants that, but because that's what the mind and body do to protect us. <clears throat> when we were cavemen and women, I'm sure it was very helpful. <laughs> so each time the patient is triggered, the same set of events happen including the prefrontal shutdown. Uh, I spent three years doing a project um, with um, Connecticut Valley Hospital um, in which we used a trauma-informed model with some of the most severely symptomatic patients. And one of the things that we, we were able to implement was to give patients time after an incident of self-harm, after a suicide attempt, to not try to process what had happened immediately because their frontal lobes were offline. And when, when staff tried to process what had happened with someone whose frontal lobe was offline, the, it was not possible. Staff were frustrated, um, patients were frustrated. So we changed the protocol. Anyone who self-injured or made a suicide attempt was given some time for all of the, their nervous systems to regulate and the prefrontal cortex to come back online. Now, I was just talking about the nervous system. Something very important, not usually part of our training, vital to help trauma survivors. All of my patients are familiar with this diagram. And here's how I explain it to them. I explain that we all have a nervous system capable of very high activation, enough activation to run for miles to be that little old lady who beats off her mugger with a cane, to be that parent that lifts a 3,000-pound car up to free the child underneath. And we all have bodies capable of very, very low activation, um, such as in hypothermia, or a medically induced coma. And, and those are our survival states. High sympathetic activation, driving action, 
low parasympathetic activation, driving in action. If you're familiar with polyvagal theory, the parasympathetic states are called dorsal vagal states. And so, so where is where is the ventral vagal system? It is in this area. I'm going to come go back here. It's in this area we call, or Dan Siegel calls, the window of tolerance. That's our bandwidth for tolerating intense emotion or depressive, low, um, tired, bored uh, feelings. If it's wide and flexible, we can tolerate our feelings instead of acting out or going numb and disconnecting. <clears throat> if it's very narrow, because, because the width and flexibility of the window of tolerance is usually directly related to the quality of attachment. Um, where have we met people who had good attachment and then were traumatized. It's rare. I've met a few. But the most common experience is that the child grows up in a very frightening, dysregulating environment. And then in that context, events happen that make it worse. So there, the window of tolerance is doesn't develop. So when... Parents are frightening. Again, the window of tolerance, as I call it, is the size of a toothpick. And you know those clients whose windows of tolerance are the size of a toothpick because they can't tolerate the tiniest feeling. In a traumatic world, danger requires chronic sympathetic activation. The child is tense, on guard, jacked up, impulsive, um, resistant, fighting, running. And unfortunately, we call these children oppositional defiant. We don't say, what's dysregulating this child's nervous system? <clears throat> we somehow treat it as if it's intentional. Or... The other state that helps a child survive trauma is a parasympathetic dorsal vagal state of numbness, disconnection, just going through the emotions, no energy. Often these are kids who get addicted to video games. And this guy here, is usually labeled an underachiever. And sometimes, if this child is lucky, he will get diagnosed as depressed and he will get care. Whereas this child who's diagnosed oppositional defiant is more likely to get punished or, uh, or controlled. Now, over time, the nervous system adapts to a threatening world. And we see that because, again, regardless of diagnosis, we see patients who come to us with huge problems, with impulsivity, high-risk behavior, and total absence of judgment. I remember having done my um, my predoctoral internship on a psychiatric unit. I remember wanting to shake people and say, "Where was your judgment?" Now I know, of course. In 1989, we didn't know about the prefrontal cortex. Um, these are clients who are often resistant to treatment, hyper vigilant, suspicious, and even hostile to caretakers. Remember, their experience of caretakers has not 
been one that would engender trust. Um, often they have a host of anxiety symptoms. Uh, sympathetic arousal drives racing thoughts, sometimes confused with bipolar. Um, flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive symptoms, all are driven by sympathetic hyperarousal and also self-destructive, suicidal, and addictive behavior. And then we also get the chronically hypo-aroused client. Clients who present with chronic depression, there is no affect, there's often no there there. Um, if the client feels anything, what we hear is, I feel dead inside. Um, parasympathetic hypoarousal affects cognitive processing. These guys up here think too fast. The parasympathetic hypoarousal client is like thinking through molasses. It's slow. Um, and often we feel like we're dragging every word out of that client. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the clients who alternate between the two states. Usually, if you, you know, you can draw this diagram on a piece of paper and show it to patients. It is in, of its, is in and of itself a, a therapeutic intervention. Because once the patient starts to notice the way that their nervous systems drive the distress they're experiencing, they're much more interested in what they can do to regulate their nervous systems. I often say, you know, you're fine. It's your nervous system that's a little bit of a problem. You know, your, your nervous system is very traumatized. Uh, or, or even, you know, the, the problem is that you're not screwed up. Your nervous system is screwed up. And, and, and but we can work on that together, right? Because your nervous system deserves a little helping hand here. This is what I call the post traumatic roller coaster. And and especially on inpatient units, you're going to see a lot of clients who've been riding the post-traumatic roller coaster. These individuals are triggered by every everyday kinds of things. They have huge triggered reactions, but they don't know that it's triggering. And so the instinctive response of most people is to start avoiding the triggers, isolating, not going out, reducing uh, social activity. But unfortunately, the more the patient isolates, the more stimulus discrimination becomes impaired. What's stimulus discrimination? It's the ability to discriminate between a real danger and a triggered feeling of danger. So the more isolation, the more easily triggered, the more the client isolates, avoids, um, and, and, and sometimes the opposite. Sometimes as the client isolates, and becomes more dysregulated, they become more impulsive. And, and so this cycle continues, right? Desperate attempts to stop the flooding, um, but that result in more flooding. And then the client discovers some substance, some compulsive behavior that brings some blessed relief. It might be digging the fingernails into the hand 
It might be a couple of beers. It might be restricting food. It might be binging or binging and purging. Um, all kind of could be smoking. And that relief, however, has a short, has a short uh, time life. Because when the drug effect wears off, even the effects of adrenaline that you get from high-risk behavior wears off. And, and when the drug effect wears off, the urgency to seek more relief starts to lead to more self-injury, more restricting, more binging and purging, more substances, um, harder drugs, um, more frequent use of drugs, the client feels more and more desperate, constantly chasing those moments of relief. And finally, the only thing left to bring relief is suicide or, or homicide. More often in our clients, suicide. In the prison system, homicide. And one of the things that's very, very important is that as the roller coaster spins dizzily, um, the client is not afraid of dying, right? I'm thinking of, of the um, substance abusing clients who are told, you know, you're killing yourself. But they're less afraid of killing themselves <clears throat> than they are of feeling. Same with the anorexic, right? Restricting numbs the body. It's more scary to feel than it is to die. Same with suicide. So to treat trauma in the 21st century, we have to address the inhibition of the prefrontal cortex. How do we do that? We do that by integrating very simple mindfulness-based techniques, differentiating thoughts, feelings, um, body or physical reactions. Even when my patient says, I'm going to kill myself, I say, huh, is that a thought? Is that a feeling? Or is that more of an impulse? Curiosity is, is a state that is part of mindfulness. You know, in the mindfulness world, we talk about noticing what comes up with interest. Curiosity is interest. Helping the client to be curious is a therapeutic intervention. Providing psychoeducation, my new book, Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma, was written to provide psychoeducation to traumatized individuals and their therapists to provide a conversation that can be had, but also to give the trauma survivor, accurate information um, to help individuals distance from their symptoms so that they can change their relationship to the symptoms. So distinguishing thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations, psychoeducation, addressing triggers and triggering. I, I'm surprised that my patients put up with me because trigger is a word that occurs 20 to 100 times a session. Um, I assume that distress is related to triggers unless some catastrophic event has happened in my patient's life. And I have to help my patients understand the role of triggering so that they can reality test. 
so that they can see. But the people around me are not bad people. But when they do this, it triggers me. When, when staff do that, it triggers me. And, and when we understand, when we help people understand that they're triggered, it actually helps them to have a better sense of cause and effect. So here's an example here. Here's a client who is who was actually in a state hospital in Massachusetts. Um, and I arrived for my monthly half hour visit to the to the patients that we uh, earmarked as being most important to um, to use a trauma form treatment with. And she was one of them. So I'm very cheerful, very important. <clears throat> I say, oh, I hear you cut last night. What might have triggered you? Deliberately keeping my voice light. Because if my facial expression and tone are stern, I'm going to trigger the client. And then <laughs> there's no point in having the conversation. <clears throat> so I say, what might have triggered you? And she says what most people say. I don't know. I just hate myself. Don't let I don't know stop you for a moment. I don't know is because the prefrontal cortex is shut down. So I say, well, what was going on just before you cut? And, and she says, my boyfriend was supposed to call me, but he didn't. Huge trigger. Loss is an even bigger trigger than threat for trauma survivors. Hmm, what feelings and thoughts came up when he didn't call? Notice I don't ask, how did you feel? Because that's a thinking question. What feelings and thoughts came up? I was mad at myself for trusting him. That's why I hate myself. So I have to communicate that I understand she doesn't hate herself for cutting, although in Massachusetts in those days, it added three months to her hospital stay each time she self-injured. Um, she wasn't mad at herself for cutting. She was mad at herself for trusting. And I say, ooh, you probably couldn't tell anyone because you felt ashamed for trusting him. And she said, yeah, I thought, what kind of fool am I for trusting him? And I say, well, when you had that thought, what a fool am I? What feelings came up? She says, I wanted to kill him, and I wanted to kill me. Two sides of the same coin. It's a fight response. And, and a fight response can go either way. And I say, wow, how overwhelmed were you? Overwhelm is the magic word that communicates to trauma survivors that you get it, that they don't just have feelings. They have overwhelming feelings. And she says, completely overwhelmed. I couldn't stand it. And I say, well, cutting triggers adrenaline. So you feel calmer. You were just trying to get control back, huh? And she says, yeah, but now I'm feeling stupid and my arm is killing me. This used to freak out Westboro State Hospital. I freaked out so many state hospitals because the, the powers that be say, you're not going to reinforce self-injurious behavior. I say, no, I'm going to explain to people why it works and they're going to tell me why it doesn't if i explain to them why it doesn't work they're going to say but it does which which is more useful and i say well <clears throat> do you want me to show you something else that will help you feel less overwhelmed it won't work as well as cutting let's be honest dbt skills are not nearly as 
instantly and completely effective as cutting. But as I said to her, it won't get you into trouble. And she says, sure, teach away. I'd like to survive this weekend. So over and over again, helping clients to notice that they're triggered. And uh, I'm just looking at the time because uh, I want to just uh, mention sensory motor psychotherapy, a body-centered talking therapy uh, specifically geared for working with trauma. And because that's really where the somatic piece of trauma treatment, as I know it and write about it, is informed by. Mindfulness skills, very important. Asking clients to notice, even a past event, I can say, rewind the tape and let's go frame by frame and just notice. Because if I ask them what happened or why they did it, we're going to be in the thinking brain and that's not going to help. A menu question, a multiple choice question, when you have clients who have a hard time putting things into words, ask multiple choice questions because that will increase prefrontal activity and make it easy to process. We can even use better or worse questions, right? When you vent your anger, when you scream at your roommate, do you feel better or do you feel worse? Very simple idea from sensory psychotherapy, helping clients to notice that they're triggered, to notice does your nervous system go up or down, and then teaching them to try out all the different things they may have learned that help them to regulate the nervous system. The language is Let's help your nervous system. See what happens if you notice you're triggered and you just keep saying, I'm triggered, I'm triggered, I'm triggered. I remember someone who asked me, will that make it go away? And I said, no, but it will help you to know where you are. And she said, okay, that would be good. Uh, DBT skills. I have nothing against DBT skills. I wish they were a little more somatic, a little easier to retrieve when your prefrontal cortex is offline. If you wonder why aren't they using their DBT skills, it's because you can't retrieve the DBT skills. You can't remember you have them if the prefrontal cortex is shut down. I love to use somatic techniques. Um, so all of these are in your handout. Sighing instead of breathing. The hand on the heart. Um, grounding, not visually, grounding with the feet. Um, lengthening the spine for the depressed. Lengthening the spine from the bottom up. And very importantly, um, helping maximize positive state, helping our patients to, to sustain positive states. Very, very hard to do because positive feelings are often dangerous in a dangerous world. Enjoying our clients. You know, this idea uh, that the treatment has to be serious and in hospitals even more serious than in outpatient therapy really goes against the grain of what the attachment research says. The attachment research says secure attachment is built not on the, just on the ability to relieve distress, but to prolong 
positive states. That's what our patients need. So I'm going to end because I know we have to, we have some questions by just reminding you that of Stephen Porges idea of the social engagement system, governing the muscles of the face, the eyes and eyelids, the larynx for speaking, the middle ear for listening, and the tilting and turning movements of your head and neck. When you use all of these elements, our peace feels safer and usually can process uh, what we're saying more effectively. So I want to end with these brilliant words from Daniel Hughes, the international expert on reactive attachment disorders. He says the qualities we have to bring to every session are those of playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And sometimes we get so focused on the seriousness of our task that we forget that we will be more effective if we're playful and curious, not just accepting and empathic. So let me stop because uh, I know we, we want some time for questions. So Erica, are you going to? I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. That was a phenomenal presentation. I don't know about others, but listening to you speak, my nervous system was certainly triggered into a lull of relaxation. So you, you certainly have a gift with words and presenting. I did not see a question yet. If anybody does have a question, please feel free to either text it into the chat or you can always text me. Oftentimes, people have to run to their 1 p.m. I totally understand that. <laughs> you do yes. have a fan base, Dr. Fisher. Um, you have a lot of trauma-informed therapists who are quite impressed. They are wondering, where can we get your books? Um, probably the easiest way. Uh, to find the book is to go to my website, fisher.com, and uh, you can click on, um, I'm trying to think, where is it? It's, I think it might be on the homepage, um, and there's a, a link to Amazon. That will help if you, if you can't remember the title, it, you'll find it on my website. It's Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma. And if you Google Dr. Janina Fisher, you will find her beautiful website. Uh, um, Bill, can you unmute Kelly Williams, please? Um, in the meantime, Dr. Uh, Rosemary Coratola, thank you, Dr. Fisher, fantastic presentation. Dr. Cicely Rogers, another one of our psychologists, says, what are your thoughts on trauma-focused group therapies in any level of care? Um, you know, um, I, I think group therapy is wonderful for trauma survivors, but the most effective group therapies, I've been, in my opinion, are group therapies that focus not on traumatic events, but focus more on the effects of trauma. Because, because if we focus on the events in a group, what will happen is that not only will the person disclosing be triggered, but the entire group will be triggered. So that's usually not so helpful. In the groups that I've run, we we have a talk in the very first meeting, and maybe in a hospital setting, it would have to be 
repeated over and over each time that in a group of trauma survivors, everyone may be triggered before we even sit down and that we ask group members to be sensitive to not triggering each other. Um, but there's plenty to talk about talking about the day-to-day -day effects, talking about how they deal with triggers, learning mindfulness-based skills um, to help them uh, manage their nervous systems. I've, I've done whole groups just on that nervous system diagram, and it could be part of a check-in at the next group. Hey, how's everybody's nervous system doing today? That would be a really great way to have a group check-in. Thank you. T. Cutler says, wonderful presentation, very informative and thought-provoking. Thank you. Were we able to find Kelly Williams to unmute her? Her mic is open now. Go ahead, Kelly. Kelly, can you hear us? There, there we go. Okay, I, I had I had myself okay. muted. Anyway, I there just want go. to say thanks so much, uh, Dr. Fisher. I just wanted to say very briefly because I could go on and on and on and on ad infinitum about your presentation, which is so incredibly remarkable. Uh, uh, so many things spoke to me. We have been having more presentations as of late. Uh, 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 relative to trauma-informed care. And in the business that we are in here with uh, people's mental health, with people's lives, it's all about trauma, mm -hmm. primarily. It, it informs right. everything. It informs everything we do, every interaction, every treatment, every discharge plan, everything. And you have been remarkable. And one of the things that really spoke to me too was when you spoke about your affect and your tone of voice when you're addressing a patient in a hospital setting who cut themselves. This is not behavioral. This is not a consequence of, you know, uh, a, a bad decision. Uh, it's so much more than that. And the way you address your patients is, is really uh, 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 how they get well. Uh, and it was really, uh, we learned something new every time we have the gift of someone talking about trauma-informed care. Oh, thank you, Kelly. That's that's great. That's great to hear. I think what I call trauma-informed communication is so important. Absolutely. Thank you. We um, have just a few minutes left. I got a question from one of our social workers here at the hospital. Thank you so much for this presentation from Alicia Whalen. I'm curious, how does this model work for those who have a diagnosis of autism? and have trouble identifying their feelings? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what trauma and autism have in common is a very, very narrowed window of time for the autism spectrum community. That very narrow window of tolerance is not the result of traumatic attachment. It's the result of their processing difficulties and tendency to become overstimulated. So, you know, menu questions, multiple choice questions help. Um, be, the understanding that we have to use simpler language. We have to be more concrete. Um, if necessary, you know, I think about the splinter skills of people on the spectrum. How can I use the splinter skills they have to help them make sense of what they're experiencing? Um, I remember I, my first job was working in a program for what we then called autistic children. I we had a, a young boy, about 12, who was completely focused on the Boston subway map. And he would walk around all day just saying, you get off at Park Street, you walk east to the Arlington Street stop. He could 
recite the entire subway map of Boston. And so we used that. We would say, okay, at the Arlington Street stop, we have to eat lunch. <laughs> at the Arlington Street stop, we have to focus on math because we just basically used his his preoccupation and perseveration to help him broaden his awareness. So that's that's my suggestion for autism spectrum. And I think we have one more minute uh, from Kimberly Horowitz. How much time would be ideal for a cooling off period after a self-harming incident? And That's a very good question. I was actually thinking about that as I was talking today. Um, <clears throat> I would say probably an hour, which an hour minimum. I mean, so it takes somewhere between 45 minutes and two hours to for the body to recalibrate after a huge, you know, some farms a huge sympathetic activation driven event. And after the event, the body goes into a parasympathetic state, frontal lobes offline, and it takes one to two hours for the body to recalibrate. Uh, and then I think the the idea of of keeping it light and not asking why questions, because why questions, you know, require very difficult mental processing. And, and I think what happens with so many patients is they start answering the why questions in some way that they've learned from some mental health professional. Oh, I do it to punish myself. And I always say, huh, if you do it to punish yourself, that's confusing to me. Because why would you do something that brings such relief as a form of self-punishment? I'm not getting it. <laughs> because cutting does not cause as much pain as it causes relief. And so it's not a very effective form of self-punishment. Well, thank you. you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All day. We really, really appreciate it, Dr. Fisher. So much appreciation to you. Stay well, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you again in person soon. I hope so. Take good Thanks, care, everybody. everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Your call will be disconnected.